All right, we're glad you guys are here this morning. Uh, We're moving on in our series that we began a few weeks back through the Gospel of Mark. Uh, uh, The series is called Serving Like Jesus, and uh, so we want to be made into the image of Christ. And we're in chapter 2, rounding out chapter 2, a few more verses after today. But the title of the sermon today is The Impact Jesus Makes, and uh, So uh, we're going to read a couple of parables, a a few little parables that Jesus responds with here. And so let's read the text together and uh, let's see where God uh, works in our hearts today through this. The disciples of John and the Pharisees were fasting and then they came and said to him, said to Jesus, why do the disciples of John and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, Can the friends of the bridegroom fast while the bridegroom is with him? He said, As long as they have the bridegroom with him, they cannot fast. But the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them, and then they will fast in those days. He says, No one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, or else the new piece pulls away from the old, and the tear is made worse. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins, or else the new wine bursts the wineskins, and the wine is spilled, and the wineskins are ruined. But new wine must be put into new wineskins. This is the word of God. Let's uh, bow together and pray. Our great uh, Heavenly Father, we do just uh, bow before you this morning again, and Lord, we're thankful for your word. God, we pray this morning that your Holy Spirit would just speak to us through your truth. God, give us clarity of your message and your hope. Lord, transform hearts and lives today. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, some, I guess I could start off by asking the question, how many of you ladies like to go shopping? Uh, now ladies like to go shopping. Guys like to go shopping too sometimes, depending on what it's for, but... I thought I might get an amen or two from uh, ladies, but uh, but I heard about this one lady who was taking her child shopping, and uh, she had spent all day in stores going through several checkout lanes and things like that, and finally she came to one place, and she uh, started to check out, and uh, the, the, the clerk handed the little boy a lollipop, and the mother turned and looked at her son, and she says, now what do you say? And he said, charge it. That's right. <laughs> so he was obviously paying attention, right? I, I, I shared that story with you to help you understand how the life, the life that's lived can impact others around it. And our lives obviously impact our children's lives. And even just by spending time with us, they learn things and they copy things and things like that. That's a message in itself. I could stop right there, couldn't I? Uh, but, uh, you know, when somebody's simply observing you and being present with you, uh, you're making an impact on them in one way or another. And, and you know, I, I, I share that with you this morning because the title of the message today is uh, about this impact of Jesus, the impact that Jesus makes. And, and I want you to understand today the impact that Jesus, the presence of Jesus, can make on your life. And, uh, you know, living your life in the presence of Jesus can impact who you are. It can impact what you do. And today, as we read through this passage, uh, I I see a message from Jesus about a new way of life and how this life with Jesus in it impacts the life. And that's what we're looking at today. So I want to share with you three ways Jesus' presence impacts your life today. Uh, the first one, uh, we've already got it up there, says, it says this. I want you to understand that the physical presence of Christ presents a joyous life. The physical presence of Christ presents a joyous life. When we look in verse 18, uh, we see this interaction, the, these Pharisees, and, you know, uh, here they come again. They're questioning the actions of Jesus. This is a recurring theme, maybe you've noticed over the last few weeks. They're following Jesus around. They're asking questions. You know, back in verse 7 in chapter 2, they will know who can forgive sins but God alone, right? When he heals this uh, lame man in the middle of uh, uh, 
Miss uh, Simon Peter's mother-in-law's house, right? And so then they asked last, uh, a, a couple weeks ago, I guess, uh, when, uh, or maybe last week when uh, Levi had Jesus to his home and Jesus was eating with the tax collectors and sinners, and in verse 16, uh, they, they want to know, how can he eat with these tax collectors and sinners? And so, and now here in verse 18, they want to know why in the world Jesus and his disciples are not fasting when they're supposed to be fasting. You know, it's like he doesn't know a lot of things, you know. I mean, that's kind of the way they're looking at it. And they're probably asking this because of this feasting and drinking that they saw Jesus and his disciples doing in the house of Levi or Matthew. Uh, you know, they're, they're observing it. They're wondering why he's eating and drinking with sinners. And they're wondering, why, is Jesus and his, why are Jesus and his disciples partying when we're fasting? Maybe a little jealousy. I don't know, but uh, I'd say it's more judgment, don't you? But the disciples of John, they refer to here, John the Baptist, they, they were probably fasting because this would have been about the time that John uh, was put into prison. And so maybe they were fasting and praying for God to release uh, you know, their, their spiritual leader or uh, it, it also, and most likely, most commentators believe that they were probably fasting because of this anticipation of the Messiah and his arrival. And, you know, Jesus had begun his ministry, and so they were really caught up in that. And that's why John the Baptist's uh, uh, disciples were fasting. But uh, the Pharisees, it says, they were also fasting. And so you wonder, well, what, what were the Pharisees fasting about? And we, we've shared with you, and most of you probably know and understand the Pharisees, these religious leaders among the Jews, they, they uh, tried to meticulously obey the law. And, and uh, they held, tried to hold it to a T. They built a fence around it. And they, they tried to do all kinds of things. And, but they also went beyond the law. And they prescribed fasting for themselves uh, as much as two, two days a week. You, know, you hear that phrase a few times in the New Testament. You know, they're fasting twice in a week is... It seemed like it was Tuesday and Thursdays. They, they fasted, and, and it, it kind of became a ritual for them, I think, that they fasted, and they uh, stood in the streets, and they prayed out loud, and it was kind of a ritual for them a lot of times to be observed by men rather than a real means to seek the presence and power of God in their life. And so that's, that's what was going on with the Pharisees. But when we're talking about fasting, maybe some of you don't really understand what, what, exactly what that is, but... But in the Bible, when you talk about fasting, or we see fasting mentioned, it always refers to abstaining from food and sometimes abstaining from drink for a set amount of time for spiritual purposes. Uh, in, in the Jewish way of life, the Day of Atonement was really the only uh, day that was mandatory, that was set aside for fasting. Um, there were other um, ceremonial times, seasons, and Rituals that they observed where there was fasting. Sometimes uh, it's individual fasting and we read about individuals fasting. We read about Jesus fasting and, 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 and others and Paul and, and others. But, uh, and sometimes it's corporate fasting. And, it, it, and what fasting is, is really it's a means for people to humble themselves and seek God and to demonstrate that they, and in your heart really to believe that spiritual sustenance is more valuable, more important to you than physical sustenance. That you want to hear from God. You want God's bread of life more than you want the bread in this life. And that's really what, it, what it's kind of about, you know. And, and God's people should fast for specific reasons, for set periods of time, and, uh, you know, to, to seek God's will and to draw closer to Him. I've done it. Some of you have been aware of that. We've done it as a church on a couple of times. And anytime, you know, anytime there's an important decision to make or we're praying for God to do something, then, then we want to fast and seek God. And I think that's scriptural. And, and, but look at Jesus' response in verse 19. This is really what I want us to get to here uh, with this point. Jesus <coughs> said this. He said, can the friends of the bridegroom fast while the bridegroom is with them? He said, as long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. And so what Jesus did here is he used this illustration 
from a Jewish wedding. Jewish weddings were awesome. And, and uh, you know, the betrothal usually lasted about a year. And then when they would come together, and I've described some of the ceremonies, the groom would make his way to the home. He would grab the bride, take her back to his father's house. And there would be a big supper and meal. And that celebration lasted a week. And when we get married, we take our, our brides on a honeymoon for a week a lot of times, or a few days, right? Well, the honeymoon was all celebrated right there. It, it was part of the party, you know? And, and so it, it was a time of, of celebration. And, and so in this illustration, Jesus is, is giving us this picture that he is the bridegroom and the disciples are the wedding guests. And he's saying that since he's here now, since the bridegroom is here with his followers, with the guests, there's no reason for fasting. It'd be like fasting during a Jewish wedding celebration. You know, nobody's going to do that. The cake's too good, right? I mean, you, I, 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 and, and I, I, I have, there have been a couple of times where I have been utterly disappointed because I've been in the middle of a fast when there's something going on where there's some good food. You know what I'm saying? And so it'd be the same thing. It'd be like, no, no, I'm going to schedule my fast around the marriage celebration, right? Because you don't fast during a marriage celebration, it's like a Jewish wedding feast. It's a, it's a joyous occasion. It's a time for celebration. It's, it's not a time for mourning. You know, you mourn at a funeral. You celebrate at a wedding. At least most of us do, right? And, and so, but, but, you know, fasting's inappropriate for a wedding. And so he's saying, what Jesus is saying is his physical presence with them, it's a time of joy. It's a time of happiness. It's a time of celebration. It's not a time of mourning and sorrow and sadness. And unfortunately, a lot of times when people come into our churches, that, that's kind of what it gets to be like, isn't it? it you know, people come in and they, they see all the hub job. I heard about one church where a guy had a heart attack, and they called an ambulance, and they come in, and they carried out 10 people before they found the right guy. I don't know if it's true or not, but, uh, but anyway, that's how dead some of our churches are, it seems like. But, but uh, uh, one, of, one of the uh, uh, Supreme Court justices, Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr., Jr., he served the Supreme Court for 30 years, and he is known for his wit and different things, and at one point in his life, he explained his choice of career by saying this. He said, I might have entered the ministry if certain clergymen I knew had not looked and acted so much like undertakers. And so I'm saying that to you today because I want you to understand, even though Jesus is not physically present with us, he is present with us as believers, isn't he? And uh, too many Christians don't live with the joy and peace that comes from knowing Christ. Uh, when we come to church for worship, uh, most of the time it ought to be like a celebration. There ought to be a lot of joy. There ought to be peace. And people ought to see that uh, because we're celebrating a resurrected Savior who's made an impact on our lives and uh, who's given us a promise that the, out of this world, right? And so uh, church life and obedience to Christ, it doesn't have to be gloomy. It doesn't have to be boring to follow Jesus. It can be fun and exciting and it can be adventurous. You know, and Jesus even said in John chapter 10 and verse 10, he describes the thief, Satan, he says he comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But he says, but I came that they might have life and have it abundantly. He, uh, have it to its fullest, to be full of life. And uh, that, that's the way we ought to be as Christians because of the presence of Christ in our hearts and in our lives. And I heard about a, a man who came to Christ and he didn't have any church background and so he hadn't learned all the church lingo you know he hadn't practiced praise the lord hallelujah and amen and things like that and it just wasn't in him to say anything like that and when he was baptized his pastor said he was so overjoyed when he came up the only thing he could think of to express himself when he came out of the baptism waters was without cussing was say he came up shouting and saying hot dog hot dog hot dog oh man and the preacher said you know what he said that man never lost that hot dog celebration view of his salvation in his walk with God. And I hope you don't lose yours either. Because the presence of Christ in your life is not something to fast and mourn about. It's, it's something to celebrate. And, uh, you know, it, it, the presence of Christ presents a joyous life. 
a changed life, a transformed life. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. But, but I believe faith in him and his spiritual presence brings joy. And, and if we can have that, if we can have uh, this joy today, I, I can't imagine what it's going to be like when we finally see him face to face. You know? The pre physical presence of Jesus presents joy in your life. Another impact that Jesus makes on a life is this. And I want, you, I want you to understand this one. And, uh, point number two, this impact. Jesus, the, the physical absence of Christ prescribes a seeking life. Now, what do you mean by this? Well, when you look at verse 20, Jesus, he says something here that may, maybe catches folks off guard that know about the Jewish wedding feast. He says, but the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them and then they will fast in those days. And so, you know, it's kind of unthinkable for the bridegroom to be taken away. But imagine, you know, as soon as the wedding's over, the bridegroom's gone. And now that, that's, that's not a joyous thing, is it, in a way, when you think about it. And, and so there's this contrast from the physical presence of Jesus as the bridegroom to being taken away, leaving this physical absence. And, and so he says, then... That's when fasting is necessary. And, uh, you know, I think this reference to the bridegroom being taken away is, is Jesus hinting or pointing to uh, his you know, crucifixion, his death, his burial, and, uh, you know, and then his uh, resurrection and ascension when he's caught up and taken up to be with the Lord until he comes again. And, and uh, I think he's pointing to that, and it's something for us to think about. And in John 14, in John's Gospel... You know, it's the last few days before Jesus is crucified and he's with his disciples and he's really teaching them. He's trying to drive this point home and he addresses this very thing with them in the first three verses I want to read to you. He says, let your hearts not be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also, you believe in God. Believe in me. He says, in my father's house or in my father's mansion or many rooms, if it were not so, I would have told you. And he says, I go to prepare a place for you. So he's telling them, I'm going away. And he says, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again. And I will take you to myself. That where I am, you may be also. And so he's trying to comfort them. He's trying to assure them. He says, and the bridegroom's going to be gone for a little while. I'm going to be gone for, for just a bit. But if I'm going away to prepare a place for you, I'm going to come back and take you to that place. And so Jesus was, was trying to get this point across that the time for fasting then is when he leaves. He, he says, he says in, in the text there that then they will fast in those days when, when the bridegroom is gone. And so there's something to take, something we can take from this, I think. You know, there are times in a believer's life when, when the presence of Christ seems far off. You know, it, 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 and his light seems dim. There, there are t times when, you know, you don't feel the presence and power of God in your life like you used to. Have you been there? Well, you've been there. I've been there. We, we, you know what I'm talking about. And, and listen, listen to me. Some of y'all are in that now. You're at a place where, where you're, you're desperate. You, you, you want to be closer to God. Something's not right. You don't know. Listen to me. That's the time to fast. That's the time to fast. That's the time to seek God with all you have and to seek His presence and His power. James wrote in, in chapter 4 of his letter, he says, draw near to God and He will draw near to you. And fasting, is, is that's the purpose of fasting, to draw near to God. And he says, cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. It's a time for repentance. It's time for introspection. It's a time for confession. It's a time to look to God for healing and help. He says, be wretched and mourn and weep and let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Now, we don't want to give up our joy in Christ, but it's not a time to celebrate when you know you're not as close to the Lord as you used to be. That something's dry. That something's wrong. That, that something is amiss. That's the time to fast. That's the time to seek God. That's the time to pray. And, and you do it by humbling yourself. And, and James writes, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. 
Lower yourself. That's what he's saying before the Lord. And he will lift you up. <laughs> That's what we need, isn't it? That's what we need. So it's okay for us to fast, uh, you know, today because physically Jesus is not with us. It's a day of fasting. And he's addressing that time. He's, he's gone. He's with the Lord. And spiritually he's with us. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in a second. But, but you know, and so he, physically he's not present with us today. And sometimes that spiritual battle between the flesh and the spirit requires a set time for you to seek God seriously through fasting and praying. You know, I can remember as a child being frightened during the night as I lay in my bed. It didn't happen a lot, okay? I mean, I, you know. <laughs> but I guess, you know, when I was little, you know, sometimes it was the unknown sound that caused my eyes to go silver dollar, you know. And other times, it might have been a reflection in the closet that where the door was left open, you know, the light shining in and like some eyes or something in there, you know. Sometimes it's just, you know, an overactive imagination that provoked my terror. But the answer almost always was the same for me. Mama, come here. <laughs> You know, Mama mocked, my mom mocked me and my sister. Sometimes, you know, when, when we were younger, I can, I can remember saying, Mama, come here, Mama, come here, Mama, come here, Mama, come here. <laughs> but you know what, though? Because of her love, she always came, eventually. And she would kneel down beside the bed, and somehow... Her simple presence gave me all the peace that I needed. You know, sometimes it was daddy, but most of the time it was mama. <laughs> but folks, that, that's the life we lead. Sometimes you get to a place where your greatest need is to call out to Jesus. He's all you need and he will always draw near to you. The absence of Christ Helps you understand your need for him. That's the impact Jesus can make. Let, let, let me give you one more way that the presence of Jesus can impact your life. And that's this. The spiritual presence of Christ produces a new life. So in these last two verses, in verses 21 and 22, Jesus shared two analogies, two parables to help describe the change that comes in, from the indwelling spirit of Christ to those who believe in him. He, he's, he's talking about the gospel. He's talking about the new covenant. He, he's, he's showing these Pharisees and these religious people that there's a new way to look at things that you should understand. And so that's what he's talking about. And, and what he's talking about is the actual indwelling spirit of Christ, the spiritual presence of Christ in, in a believer. And the first story, the first uh, parable he, he says, is, he shares this in verse 21, and he says this, he says, no one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. Now this is like Greek to most of us. I mean, who patches garments nowadays? I mean, you know, we don't do that, do we? I mean, you know, I mean, we just leave the holes open, you know. I mean, sometimes I don't know how some of these kids are keeping their jeans on, you know. They got so many rips in them. But anyway, but he says, or else the new piece pulls away from the old and the tear is made worse. And so, you know, today we, we've got fabrics made from all kinds of things, you know, mixed fabrics and synthetic fabrics, and most of them never shrink when you wash them. You know, uh, <clears throat> The only thing I really can think of that I've worn a lot that shrinks when you wash it is cotton, 100%. And it'll shrink, but when you put it on, it just stretches right back out. And usually it stretches more than it shrinks, doesn't it, after you wear it a while. And so, but, uh, you know, but hey, look, it, I know if you put wet wool in the, in the dryer, you can turn an XL into a medium in just a few minutes. I, I got experience from that, so trust me, I know. But, uh, but in Jesus' time... 
You know, the, the new cloth, would, the, the clothing would always shrink after, after you washed it. You got it wet and it would shrink. And, and so a person who got a new garment would have to always buy it a couple of sizes too big, you know, or a little bit big so that when it shrank, it would fit them the way they wanted. That was just the way that, that, that the fabrics did at, at that time. And, and, so, uh, and, and so garments at that time, too, you know, they were often uh, easily worn and moth-eaten, so they'd get tears. And, you know, they didn't have, you know, shopping centers around like we do where, you know, most people just had maybe one or two things that they wore. And they, they weren't like us where we got, we could, most of us, our closet, we could clothe a small nation, you know, a third world. But... Uh, but anyway, but, but, but they had to be constantly repaired. And so everybody that Jesus was talking to would have understood this. And, and if you had an old robe with a hole in it, he's saying with a rip or a tear where a piece of cloth had been ripped up, he says it's foolish to sew a new patch of cloth over that hole because sooner or later that new cloth is going to shrink. And when it does, it's going to pull those threads from the outer side and it's going to tear that hole open and make it even bigger. So that's basically what he's saying. And I know most of you ladies understood that already, but that was for the guys. Uh, but uh, and so what Jesus is saying, he's implying here is that his way, the gospel is a new way. He's saying his way can't be patched in to the law because the Pharisees, they're all about this law and, and, and the... Um, uh, the letter of the law and all these extra things that they added to the law, you know, the, their old ritualism, their hyper seriousness, this outward show of re religiosity that they always had. And he's saying, you know, all that represents the old garment, the ways that the Jews lived and the way they practiced. And the new patch is Jesus and his way, it's the gospel, it's the new covenant. And, and he's saying, you know, it's the bridegroom who feasts and enjoys life with his disciples uh, who, who, and he, they live in the spirit of the law, not the letter of the law. And so Jesus is saying, look, you can't add the new to the old. He says, you need something completely new. And that's what he's brought, is something completely new, like a whole new garment. You can't patch it. You got to have a new garment, you know. And so his explanation, it sheds light that there's this new covenant for people who are made new in him. It, it's, it's an explanation for these Pharisees who they're seeking to hold on to the, uh, uh, the old covenant when Jesus is bringing a new covenant in his own blood. And so that's, that's what he's, Jesus is trying to communicate to them. He's saying, look, you can't continue to keep the law when... This is a day of grace. You can't depend on the law. And so, there's freedom in, in a sense. But anyway, and in verse 22, he tell, gives us another parable. It's very similar to the one in verse 21. He talks about these wineskins. He says, no one puts new wine in old wineskins. Now, some of y'all know about this, I'm sure. But you don't use wineskins. That's the part that confuses you. But, but he says, but the, the new wine will burst the wineskins, and the wine is spilled, and, and, and the wineskins are ruined. So he says, if you put new wine in old wineskins, then the old wineskins are going to burst, you lose the wineskin, and you lose the wine. If you sew a new piece of cloth on an old garment, it makes the hole bigger, you lose the patch and the garment. It makes it worse. And so that's what he's saying. You can't Put the new covenant in the old covenant with all that you've attached to it or you mess it up. <laughs> That's kind of what he's getting at. But in the ancient world, the skins of goats were stripped and uh, they were partly tanned and they would be filled with new wine. They would make them into these, these wine skins that would hold their wine. And the natural elasticity of the skin and the flexibility and the sturdiness of a new skin allowed them to be filled and strong enough so that when the fermentation process starts and all that chemical reaction starts building up pressure inside the skin, they wouldn't burst. 
So this is what he's getting at. But if you put new wine in an old wine skin that had already been stretched and weakened and thinned out, and then the fermentation process starts to take place, then it's going to bust. That's what Jesus is saying. So, and then everything's lost. The wine and the wine skin. And so, and so both of these parables are about the relationship of Jesus and of the gospel to the traditional form of Judaism. And, um, and so he, he's, Jesus is illustrating this new radical way of life that has come because of his own life, death, burial, and resurrection. The life that Jesus brings. It's, Jesus is the new patch, and he's the new wine. That's what he's getting at. And so the point, the point is this, okay? Hang with me here. Jesus is not an addendum to the Old Testament practice of Judaism. You know? He's not something you tack on that, you know, that's just, just to add to it. You know, he can't be integrated into cultural Judaism or, or any of the uh, um, uh, rituals or, or uh, traditions of Judaism or any other religious backdrop that you might choose. Jesus is above all that. He exceeds all that. He's greater than all that. Jesus sets the standard. You see, this is his point. And, and the question, you know, that, that proposed this image of the wedding feast and the two parables, it's, it, it, it's really not whether the disciples will be like sewing a new patch of an, on an old garment or refilling an old container with new wine. You know, with, will, will they make room for Jesus? It, you know, it, he's asking, will, the, will you, will the disciples, the question is, will they forsake their current life. Not will they add him to what they're already doing. That's, that's the point Jesus is making. You know, and that's, why, that's where we make a mistake a lot of times. You see, too many of us want to, we want Jesus, but we want to tack him into our little pocket in our life where we want him, and we want to exclude him from, from everything else, and we just want a little bit to change. And Jesus said, no, nah, it don't work like that. If you let me come in, Everything you know will be destroyed. It'll be gone. And everything will be made brand new. That's what he's saying. I hope you're understanding this. <laughs> the question's, you know, not whether they will tack him on to their Judaism. It's whether they will forsake their current life like Levi did. Remember? And we, we explained that if you were here when Jesus came to the tax booth. Levi left everything and followed Jesus. He can't go back to being a tax collector. That's over. And whatever it is that you have done before you met Jesus, that's gone. It ought to be gone. That's the point he's trying to make. You know, will they abandon their previous misconceptions and, and will they receive this new message of hope that Jesus brings them and the adventure that he's leading them on? That's, that's, that's what he's asking. That's, that's the point he's making. You see... Jesus didn't come to help, really, to help make you a better you. Did you know that? He, he doesn't save you to make you a better you. That's, a lot of people think that, that he came to make you a better you. No, he came to destroy you and make you a new you. That's what he came to do. <laughs> I heard about this hillbilly mother. She had nine or ten children, and one of the little boys... Uh, fell down and he was rolling out on a newly paved uh, blacktop road. <clears throat> he was covered in tar, head to foot, you know. He was a mess. And the mother wouldn't let him come in the house. You know, she kept him outside and she was trying to clean the sticky tar off of him. And this is what she said. She said, I declare, Tom, I reckon it'd be easier just to have another one than to clean you up. <laughs> Oh, man. Jesus came to make you new. Not just to clean you up, but to make you a new person. That's the impact that Jesus can make on your life. 2 Corinthians 5.17, he says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, 
He's a new creature. The old has passed away. Behold, everything's made new. The new has come. You know, I, I want to tell you as we wrap things up, some of you are not pleased with who you are without Christ. Or maybe some of you realize this morning that, you know, maybe I've just tacked Christ on. I've not let him consume me. I've not let him transform me. Nothing's really changed. That's the sad truth. You need to let Christ invade your life. You need to take yourself off of your throne, the throne of your own heart, and let him reign there. <laughs> you know, if you're not pleased with who you are apart from Christ, look, we all shouldn't be pleased with who we are apart from Christ, but the good news is you don't have to remain a struggling, defeated sinner. Through the indwelling presence of Christ in your heart and life, you can become a victorious child of God. <laughs> with a reason to celebrate. <clears throat> with, with, with an adventure that, that you can't even begin to fathom. That's the impact that Jesus makes on a life. Jesus gives you joy. And when you're down and alone and feeling separated and isolated, He urges you to humble yourself. And to call out to Him through prayer and fasting. So my question today for you is, will you give yourself to Him today? He can make you new. That's the impact Jesus makes. Let's bow our heads. Let's respond this morning with a, a time of response. Father, we do bow before you this morning. And Lord, we thank you for this message of hope. And <laughs> Lord, I pray that you would help us not to try to make you who we want you to be. But Lord, we would let you make us who you want us to be. Lord, destroy us. Make us new. And use us for your glory. Right now, Lord, I pray that every heart that's convicted, that's being drawn to you, will take a step of faith towards you. And the hope you give in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together. If God's speaking to your heart, now's the time to respond in faith. Come on. <laughs>